Hi guys, my name is Alexander Lee, and today I'm going to be looking at um, three famous mathematicians, Newton, Leibniz, and Viette, and what they have to do with infinite series, infinite products, and a special transcendental number called pi. Now I meant to release this video around pi day, but I got really sidetracked by like finals and classes and labs and all that jazz. I'm sorry, not the finals. At that time they were called midterms. Oh well. So here we have uh, this thing. So have you ever really thought like, you always used pi r squared back in grade school to find the area of a circle, but have you ever really thought why it's pi r squared? Well, it's actually from the from Archimedes. <laughs> in 250 BC, he devised a proof. So he took a circle, he sectioned it up from the center to 18 slices, and if we aptly label each of these slices a through r, We'll see that if we arrange them into a much more familiar shape of a rectangle, we'll see that the radius would make up the length of one of these slices, and so subsequently the width of the new rectangle, and if we lined up the slices so, we'd see that one of their sides, and we would see pi r as the length of this rectangle. So using the formula for the area of a rectangle, area equals length times width, we see that pi r times r would give you pi r squared. Okay, cool. So now we're moving into another thing. I'll show you how these are cool and relevant in just a second. I know a lot of you have taken like differential equations, but some of you have not taken differential equations. Some of you have just started taking pre-calculus. So I want to make this like accessible to everyone. So I'm trying to like cover some bases first. <laughs> so. We know that the area of the unit circle then is just pi because the radius is just one. <laughs> but how do we know this for sure? Well, it, again in 250 BC, Archimedes bisects a hexagon, and this was the classical way that people would use to approximate pi by inscribing polygons. One of the most famous shapes to inscribe was a hexagon because back then geometry was a cult thing and it was cool and was led by this guy named Pythagoras, or Pythagoras. You may remember him triangles, from his theorem. Triangles, 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 right side, triangles, right triangles, angles, right angle triangles, triangles, by the way, triangles, only. Triangles. So, <laughs> anyway, Archimedes bisects a hexagon, inscribes it in a square, then circumscribes a dodecagon, a 12-sided polygon, outside of it, and then he finds that pi lies between these two ratios, right? So he finds an upper bound for pi and a lower bound for pi. How did he do this? Well, he looked at the sides and then divided it by the number of, by the diameter. So that gave him a ratio here for pi, because we know that pi r squared is the area. So that must make sense because Archimedes found this. So he, it was like he wasn't satisfied. He was like, what is this pi number? <laughs> Right? So, lots of people have tried to approximate it. So, in the 1700s, a Dutch guy named Ludwig van Kuhlen took 25 years of his life and did an n-gon approximation of pi. <laughs> now, imagine all these little teal things. They're sides of a 2 raised to the 62nd sided polygon. That's 4 quintillion, 611 quadrillion, and so forth sides. It took him 25 years, and he got pi precisely within 35 decimal places. He also inscribed it on his tombstone, because he was really proud of it. <laughs> As you can see, his tombstone. We also know that he also, like Archimedes, found a lower bound, which is 6 root 2 minus root 3, and an upper bound for pi, which is 12 times 2 minus root 3. Now, I'll tell you why this is important. Um, and just a second, but I wanted to cover some foundational things. In 1666, a couple of years before Kulin, Newton was at home quarantining from the bubonic plague, and he was playing around with the binomial theorem. And he saw that it relates pretty neatly with Pascal's triangle. Now, if you don't know Pascal's triangle, it's actually going to predate Newton by a couple hundred, hundred years. Um, Yang Hui discovered it. It was in the Mero Prostra. Um, I have a friend who goes to Berkeley. His name is Alexander Singh. He can probably tell me how to pronounce that, but I think it's Anchara Pingala. It's from a treatise on Sanskrit prosody, uh, essentially a mathematical text. 
uh, and it contains Fibonacci numbers, combinatorics, and even Morse code. But you can see here how they devised Fibonacci. They kind of just took the diagonal, the sum of the diagonal of each line in the uh, in Pascal's triangle, and they found the Fibonacci sequence right there before really mo a lot of people did, especially Fibonacci. <laughs> so we also find the Fibonacci numbers in nature. So the golden ratio, if you look at a nautilus shell pictured here, I've outlined like squares which represent um, each section and they correlate to the Fibonacci numbers. You can also find it in Trilometria, which is a unicellular eukaryote, and in beta tubulin, which is in its cellular walls. It's interesting how these mathematical patterns that we find actually play out in real life and nature, and I thought that was cool. If you want to check this out, I source a lot of my material from two texts, Elementary Number Theory by James J. Tattershall, and Enumerative Combinatorics by Richard P. Stanley. Anyway, going back to Newton. So we know that he takes this binomial theorem. We know that he gets Pascal's triangle. But then he does something interesting. Instead of plugging in positive integers, he plugs in negative integers. And this is the finite sum, sorry, the infinite sum that he gets. He doesn't find that it's finite until later on, which I show here that it cancels. The infinite sum is useful to us because look, if you drew out Newton's new infinite sum with the negative integers, you'd get this. And notice the 2, the 6, the 20, and the 70 down here. And notice the negative 2, the negative 6, the negative 20, and the 70 up here. It's really just Pascal's triangle rotated. The zeros are indicative of like the cancelling out of its finite sum here. They'll terminate after they've reached the coefficient n here. So why is this important for us? Well, if we took the binomial theorem, and then remember that the area of a unit circle is again pi, and we took the integral from the origin 0 to 1, we'd find that with respect to x, it equal this. <laughs> so then, this obviously represents a quarter of the unit circle. So pi over 4 would then equal this with respect to x. And then solving for pi, we get this, which is a very, very close approximation to pi. It's very similar to Leibniz approximation using our tangent of pi over 4, which I'll cover right after this. But then Newton wasn't satisfied. He, he decided, it was like, okay, well, I know that's like 1 from 0 to 1. What about from 0 to 1 half? <laughs> so he took the integral from 0 to 1 half of the binomial theorem as to the 1 half of n with respect to x, and he got this, right? <laughs> So why is this important? Because we can do trigonometry, and a lot of you understand trigonometry, so I'm not losing you. So we find that the distance, the horizontal distance, is obviously one half, right? Because you go one half units to the right. Well, then the vertical from that point there would obviously be root three over two. So we know theta, right? I hope we can find theta. <laughs> but then we also know the area to be root three over eight. So then substituting that in from the integral, we see that we get a much better thing by simplification. So pi over 12 plus root 3 over 8 will then equal this series. <laughs> and then solving for pi, we, we yank pi out, put 12 there, and then stick root 3 over 8 all the way over here. And then we get a very, very close approximation to pi within like the actual value of pi is 3.14159 something. So that, that's pretty close, pretty good, right? So it took us a lot of work before computers to get to pi, <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. Um, something interesting, Zeno's paradox, I'll get into in the next video. But here we have Gottfried Leibniz. So he, this is just the approximation using our tangent of pi over 4, which we've seen over there with Newton. Um, he really just took 1 plus x plus x squared plus x to the third all the way. And he found that's 1 over 1 minus x. So then you'll see that this series, right, from s to infinity, this infinite series, will then equal a plus a r plus a r squared. I'm sorry, a r raised to the third power, <laughs> all the way to a, and that will equal a over minus, but that equals a over 1 minus r, my bad. And that equals, wait one second. So, so then if I, instead of just using x, 
I did. And if I integrated that from 0 to 1 with respect to x, I get this, which is very, very close to, if you took the inverse tangent of x. It's very, very close to 1, is what I'm saying. And if I took the inverse tangent of 1, I get pi over 4. And since this right here, right, right, this, is very, very similar. If I plugged in 1 for x, I'd obviously get this. And solving for that, I get a pretty close approximation oops, <laughs> to pi. And if I want pi, I'll just multiply this series by 4 to cancel out the denominator, and I'd get pi. So that's Leibniz series. Now, if I moved into Viette's formula, and I begin by using Euler's derivation, <laughs> which is e to the i, which is e raised to the i times pi, I'll get cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. Branching out, you can see what I essentially want out of this are two trig identities. Sine squared theta over 2 um, will equal 1 minus cosine squared theta over 2 from the Pythagorean sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta will equal 1. And then here using a half angle formula, I get cosine theta over 2 will equal cosine theta plus 1 over 2. Now why is this important? Well, I use it to derive Viette's formula. So here's the derivation of Viette's formula. <laughs> um, I take sine of theta, I branch it out here into three terms. You'll see that 2 makes an appearance once for n equals 1, twice for n equals 2, and three times for n equals 3. If we move down here, uh, you'll see that sine of theta over theta will equal this in terms of cosine if we reduce it down further and take the limit of sine theta over 2n, we'll find that it'll just equal 1. <laughs> I'll get to why this is important. But if we go here, you'll see that he takes this and then he brings it. You see that he takes this. So looking at that from Euler, Viette was able to produce the first ever infinite product in calculus. So we take our friend, right? Sine of x will equal 2 cosine x over 2 times sine x over 2. And if we reduce that further down, so we get the limit as n approaches infinity. 2 to the n, we get the limit as n approaches infinity. 2n sine of x over 2n times the limit of n times the limit as n approaches to infinity to the product of j will equal 1 to n cosine of x over 2j. So applying the Taylor series <laughs> for things above 0, we'll find that sine of x will equal the limit from n to infinity 2n times the summation of n equals q to infinity. Um, I feel like I'm losing my general population here, so uh, I've checked my math, but y'all can check because I know essentially what I'm trying to do is show you that I'm using a half angle formula and, and the special case for it for cosine of theta existing only in quadrant one or quadrant four to be positive. So this is very cool. You'll find that Viette found the first ever um, infinite product, and he found that it's equal to 2 over pi, and substituting in our formulas, we'll see that it's root 2 over 2, right, times root 2 <laughs> plus root 2 over 2, times root 2 plus root 2 plus root 2 over 2, <laughs> and that's pretty interesting. So this is where I'll stop and move to, um, so this is where I'll stop and move into um, the Monte Carlo approach, which is a computational approximation of pi um, using a similar method, but using some probability, and I'll walk you through my code. So first let's just run it, and then I'll talk about it. So if I just hit run, 
you're going to see that it draws a couple dots on the screen and then you'll see approximation for pi. Oop, that's among us. <laughs> I hope you'll like that, but I, I got very close, right? And I can play with this. I, if I take it down to just like 10, you'll see that, oh, it, it doesn't even do that. Let's just slow it down to 1. You'll see that it makes a very, very slow um, approach, and it's not really that accurate. But if I take it up to like a hundred, it's gonna randomly um, plot dots inside a space, which I've defined here to be the unit circle essentially, and outside here. So it's all random. It's gonna keep doing this until it hits 100. So I'm gonna speed it up to 10. Oop, that was too fast. Maybe eight. But you can you can actually see it. It's getting closer, right? So if I get closer to a thousand, this essentially just tells it to uh, how many points to plot in a time at a time. So it's plotting eight points at a time, all going all the way to a thousand. Let's let's speed it up. Let's go eighty. We're not gonna sit here all day. There we go. It's close, it's getting closer, right? So if I see go to 10,000, go to 800, and I hit run. <laughs> Oof, you're gonna see it really get filled in. Yeah. It's gonna take a while, for sure. But you get a very, very close. You get a, you get a lot closer. So this is the ratio of the area to the circle. Um, you take the area of red dots inside the sir and the circle space, and you you've seen from the classical approach how people would inscribe and then circumscribe polygons. Essentially, circumscribing would be outside, inscribing would be inside. It's just a ratio thing. And here you can see um, you I do that. I divide the number of dots and so forth, right? And I get very close to pi. <laughs> and then I, I draw Among Us for you. Thought that we need. But if you want, Monte Carlo methods are actually used in data science. They show you statistical approximations of possible values here. You can see a thing in MathWorks. Instead of turtle, you can also use like NumPy and thing, but it's like you essentially generate a probability space. Like you have um this isn't the probability space, I'll just show you then. Like the circle, that is a probability space. And here's the code here, if you want to see. But you'll see it generate pi, essentially. Here's pi over 4. Here's it with 1 million points. Jeez. Um, the applications are in high energy physics, finance. I love towards data science. But, but yeah, I just wanted to make this short video just showing you these things in case you wanted to check them out. Um, and I plan to release more content after finals. So, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed my little seminar on Pi and data science and stuff. Thanks. <laughs>